I'd also like to introduce Daryl Gobbert, our Managing Principal, Chief Economist, Chief Graph Maker, and talk to you about some of the, uh, the structural issues behind the, the budget that was delivered and some of the numbers that came out of it uh, last week. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. There's a disclaimer. Most of you will have seen this various times before, so don't take too long with it. Uh, actually, strange here because you're all clients, mostly clients, and therefore I can't actually provide you with general advice. That's me. That's the budget background. Now, this will be the sixth year of global growth. And those of you who have been along to our presentations before probably have heard that we're probably one of the more optimistic groups about growth coming out of the global financial crisis. And in particular, it's important for Australia, the capital markets have recovered globally. So even countries like Greece and Ireland that were expected to collapse three or four years ago are now back borrowing in their own right. And even Ireland has had its credit rating raised twice in the last six months. So it's almost back to investment grade. North America, China, Asia, Africa, though the strongly growing areas, Europe and Japan still slow, Australia slowing. And again, the budget and the background to the world is set against this. We've got some countries where there's inflation, other countries where there's fears of deflation. So for example, still in, in, say in Japan, even parts of America, there's fear that prices will actually be falling. And in Japan, for example, house prices have been falling throughout the last 20 years. So you've got, those are some of the things that are actually keeping interest rates really quite low. But again, while we've got these concerns, in some countries house prices are rising quite strongly, including here in Australia, and part of that's being driven by low interest rates. And commodity prices now looking better. Again, this background, the public sector deficits right around the world are actually shrinking, apart from Australia. So here's one of the countries that came through the global financial crisis the best, and arguably our economy is now starting to perform not as well as other countries which went through a whole lot of pain. And uh, companies are doing very well around the world. So the public sector shrinking and the private sector actually growing. And again, I'll talk about some of the implications for Australia, but companies are actually doing very well. The budget, and there was an earlier paper come out, a group called the Commission of Audit, had a look at uh, government spending, or the federal government spending, didn't look at the tax system, but made some comments on it. And they said budget deficits need to be cut, and that was carried through in the budget. And you might have seen some stuff in the Financial Review today about the Parliamentary Budget Office, which is sort of a, an independent group set up to look at budgets. And they were agreeing that this is not so much an issue now, not even perhaps in a year or two years' time. But if things aren't changed soon, we'll have chronic deficits in the future because of the, the ageing of the population. Not so much the ageing, but the expectations people have about what incomes they should get from the, from the government as they're getting older. And so the government has said quite clearly, and the Commission of Audit said it, that this sense of entitlement needs to be wound back. And that's what we're seeing now being put forward in the budget. And that's at a personal level, an industrial level. I mean, you've seen the motor car industry in Australia essentially disappear because the government has said, well, you just don't, you're just not going to be there just because you think you know, you're doing the right thing. You've actually got to show that you are making money. And the motor vehicle industry said, well, we really can't do that in Australia. And when you look at China, this year we'll probably produce 25 million motor cars, and we're going to struggle to produce 200,000. You can sort of understand why our industry is probably not going to survive. Mm -hmm. State governments, and you hear it, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago in various, various forums. I think Mr. Weather or Mr. Kutzentonis and now Mr. Hamilton Smith are really going to be having to deal with this issue of how we fix the budget up, because they're looking at a budget deficit for this year of about a billion dollars. I would be surprised if they come out for the budget in three weeks' time, for South Australia looking at another billion dollar deficit for 2014-15, because of the issues that are there. Productivity and flexibility constraints have to be reduced. Our productivity performance, in other words, in terms of output per hour work, is really quite poor in Australia. It hasn't really grown for the last five or six years. And you know, if we don't get all this right, it could well become that we do risk becoming the white trash of Asia as they continue to grow strongly, and we sort of you know, mess around behind them. So the focus of policy is what Mr Hockey said, the budget we announced tonight, which was two weeks ago, it's the first word, not the last word. So you're going to see a lot more stuff happening over the next couple of years. The question of the government is what they can get through the Senate, both now with some of the nutters that are there, and from July 1 there will be more nutters there. So the question is going to be how that will get done. So with increased taxes, and Darren will talk about some of these, the dodge the productivity issue, and they've dodged the reform of the tax system. We're probably going to be sitting here in 12 months' time talking about the tax system because by then they will have come up with a view. Um, 
These are the major financial projections. So actual growth in expenditures, percent year on year. And as you can see here, despite all this stuff about how stiff the budget cutting is going to be, apart from 14-15, we've really got to spend it expenditure growing again above inflation. So really, the, when they talk about the cuts in spending, it's against forward budgets. It's not actually against actual spending from a year ago. Notice down here, so, so in order to get the budget deficit down from the expected $50 billion in 1314 this year to $30 billion and, and falling, but still not in surplus until we get to 1819, it really is the growth in tax revenue that's driving that. It's not really the cutting in expenditure. And 1415, you can sort of see the impacts uh, of that uh, increase in the, the debt repair levy. Darren will talk about. But after that, we've still got really what is quite strong growth in receipts, and this is principally bracket creep. POYG tax earners paying more. And this sort of shows, you know, when people are going on about, you know, how can how can we how are we going to fund the spending, I think we can say at a federal government level, we, we're sort of getting near the limit. So individual taxes, in other words, the POYG working people, here's the government, here's the levy coming on at two percent on top income earners. But even as that passes through, we've still got 7 to 8% growth essentially in uh, private income tax. Now, put that in context, that's on the assumption that there's 1.5% growth in employment at about 3% growth in wages. So the other 3% of it, almost half of the growth in tax returns is coming from bracket creep, people moving further through the top marginal rates. Company tax sort of growing about in line with inflation. Superannuation growing, they always put in for the next two years that you're all going to be cashing in your self-managed super funds and taking all these capital gains. Never happens. But that's the way they help to balance the budget. They think it's going to happen. Excises and customs, we're seeing the return of indexation of petrol and diesel. So that's sort of growing a bit faster. And then GST. Now this is the area I think the, the tax reform is going to be looking at, but you can sort of see here in order to make a significant dent in income tax of individuals, you'd have to have a significant rise in sales tax. But I don't think that's going to happen. So I think we're stuck in a system for the next several years at least that income tax rates are going to remain relatively high and people's average rate of tax is going to continue to rise. But this is some of the pressure that's now bearing for a change in the GST. Now, these blue bars, starting there about $40,000 and heading up to 90000 is average annual full-time earnings for adult males. So in other words, the main taxpayers in the individual sense. So by about now, we're ex the, the forecast would be annual full-time earnings for males will be up around about eighty-five dollars to $90,000. Now the red line shows where the marginal, the second top marginal tax rate cuts in through this period. You can see over here, this was when we were leading up to the GST because average earners were actually moving towards the very top threshold. So we had the GST change, brought down the tax rates, and so for a long period, average weekly earnings of males were actually well below that second threshold. Now we're bundling into there again. So this is going to be the pressure to actually get some change to the GST in order to bring down the marginal, or sorry, push up the marginal rates. But my concern is, is, given the demands on the public purse, there's just not really the capacity for any significant tax threshold change over the next couple of years. So then you look at company tax. Is company tax where we could actually be raising more revenue? Well, again, I'd be saying in the Australian case, we're, we're about here at 30%, coming down to 28.5%, but we're really towards the top rate of company tax being paid around the world. I mean, here you've got Ireland, where their company tax rate's 12%. So you're going to say, well, Hewlett Packard and a few others are sort of there. Very low rate of tax. Singapore sort of is around here about 20%. So you'd sort of say it's probably going to be difficult in Australia to actually even keep the tax rate at 28.5 cents where it's going to, let alone push it up. But another way of looking at this, this chart here, so company tax as a percent of the total economy, while we're here sitting here at about 30%, Australia, our company taxes account for about 5% of all the revenue in Australia, of all the spending in Australia. 
whereas the United States, which has a much higher marginal ta or company tax rate, their spend, their company tax as a percent of their economy is about two and a half percent. So you'd sort of say on a number of number of reasons, it's probably going to be difficult to get the tax rate, company tax rate to rise. It probably has to fall, but at the same time, the company tax rate take, effective take, is already one of the highest in the world. So it's going to be difficult to actually get, I think, any more money out of companies. On the expense side, the general public services, that's sort of the spending on the public service and others, that jumped with the, the bats and other things going through. Defence spending, you know, relatively small in terms of the overall, but probably one of the fastest growing because the government wants to raise the defence budget up to about the equivalent of 2% of the total economy of GDP. But notice here, with all the hoo-ha that's going on about cuts in education, this is still expected to grow quite strongly. The same with health and same with social security and welfare. So they're all growing. So even though we, all this stuff is about budget cuts, it's actually against the forward estimates, not against last year's spending. And most of you, when you talk about a cut in your budget, are probably talking about spending less this year than last year. Governments don't talk that way. They talk about savings against the future. So, and, and this is the question that the government faces. As, as the population is ageing and is expecting more, it's actually not just the ageing of the population, it's we expect more to be paid for us by the federal government and the states. These three, these two areas are becoming, as you can see, health and social security welfare already are much more than half of the total spending by the federal government. And that's going to get greater as time goes on. 